Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Council of Trent podcast. I'm your host, Catholic Answers apologist and speaker, Trent Horn. And today we are going to talk about the rapture. So this is a doctrine dealing with eschatology. So eschatology is the study of the end times, the end of the world. And from a Christian perspective, we would talk about things like the final judgment, Christ's second coming. So this is a part of eschatology. And it's a popular part of some Protestant and evangelical views of the end of the world. Now, there are some Catholics who end up hearing about the rapture, and that kind of becomes a gateway to them into these Protestant evangelical ways of thinking, not just about eschatology, but about the Church, about salvation. And so it becomes something, an opportunity for them to start to question or be skeptical of the Catholic faith and in some cases, leave the Catholic faith, which I think is is very sad over something like the rapture, because the rapture is not a fundamental disagreement that Catholics have with other non-Catholics or with Protestants. It's not something like sola scriptura or justification by faith alone or the Eucharist or the priesthood. It's not a fundamental difference, but it is a difference. And so that's why I think it's worthwhile to talk about here on the podcast today. But before we do that, though, don't be left behind. If you remember the uh, fictional book series Left Behind, I think Tim LaHaye and Jenkins is the other guy who wrote that. So I know LaHaye was one of them. Uh, Left Behind was that book series about the rapture. It really popularized the idea for a lot of people. Then they did a few movies based on it. Uh, I think one of them has Nicolas Cage. I know one of them has Kirk Cameron. You can always count on Kirk Cameron to uh, show up in uh, movies like this. So uh, don't be left behind of the other people who are subscribing to the Council of Trent podcast, YouTube channel, liking this video, leaving a comment below, and of course, supporting us at TrentHornPodcast.com. If you go there and you support us, you not only allow this podcast to grow, uh, you get access to great bonus content, my catechism study series, New Testament study series, a fancy mug to keep in your pantry, all that and more at TrentHornPodcast.com. Don't be left behind. So left behind, let's, so let's take a look at the Bible passages and dive a little bit deeper into the doctrine of the rapture itself. This doctrine comes from the 19th century, around the year 1830. John Nelson Darby was one of the first people to really popularize it. Although the word rapture goes back to a Latin word that is used in the translation of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 17. I think it's the word like repire, like to snatch or to take. So this is what Paul writes when he's talking about Christ's second coming. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. So, on the face of it, when you read this, it seems to say that when Christ comes at his second coming, the final uh, promise of the resurrection of the dead will be fulfilled. Those who have died, uh, those who have died in Christ, will rise first, and then if, you ha- if we happen to be alive at Christ's second coming, will be caught up with him. Those who are left will be caught up together. That's the Latin word. I want to say repiere. I don't know if I'm getting that right. Uh, Will be, you could also say, shall be raptured, taken up to be with Christ. And so this, this imagery is similar to when Christ was entering into the city of Jerusalem, his triumphal entry. The crowds go out to meet Christ and be united to him, and then they join with Christ and enter into the city. Now, the idea behind the rapture is that Christ will come, and all of us, those who are the believers, will be caught up to God, and those who don't believe will be left behind. Uh, the other, they, won't, they won't be taken up to God. Also, the other thing that will be left behind will be the true believers, their clothes, their personal possessions, their vehicles will be left behind. So you have in the Left Behind series things like planes crashing because all the Christian pilots are going to disappear, cars crashing, uh, mayhem and madness, and those who will be left behind will be forced to face something called the Tribulation, a final series of evils and calamities that will befall the world before Christ 
really does come in his second coming. So you're starting to see a little bit of the difference here, that the rapture doctrine relies on the idea that Christ's second coming will be split into two. Like, Christ will come to rescue the Church from the tribulation, from these final disastrous elements at the end of the world, and then he'll come again after the tribulation to usher in the final judgment. And so Catholics would disagree with the rapture because uh, the, the, the constant teaching and what the Scriptures say, when Christ returns to usher in the Second Coming, that's going to be it. There's not going to be some kind of long, prolonged gap uh, between that and then the final judgment and the resurrection of the dead and the end of the world. So let's get some of our terms right. I was talking about the tribulation. Do Catholics believe in the tribulation? Yes, we certainly do. Go to paragraph 675 of the Catechism. This is what it says of the tribulation. Before Christ's second coming, the Church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. The persecution that accompanies her pilgrimage on earth will unveil the mystery of iniquity in the form of a religious deception offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. And then this paragraph of the Catechism goes on to say, the Antichrist will be the the full manifestation of this religious deception. So the final tribulation will be uh, calamities, disasters, but even worse, will be a system that will encourage widespread apostasy or total repudiation of the Christian faith in favor of something else that will claim to be a kind of secular salvation. So there will be a tribulation, but believers who are alive at that time will go through the tribulation with other people. It will be a final test. That's why it says, before Christ's second coming, the Church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. Those who believe in the rapture claim that the faithful will be those who believe in what is called a pre-tribulation rapture. I'm going to break that down a little bit uh, when I talk about different views of the end times, but those Protestants who believe in a rapture that will take place before the tribulation believe that Christians will kind of be plucked away from the danger, unbelievers will go through the tribulation, then there will be the, the final judgment. But that is not what the Church teaches, and that's also not what the Bible teaches. We look at paragraph 675 of the Catechism. So now let's talk about four different views of the end times relating to the rapture, the tribulation, uh, Christ's return, his second coming. I'm going to break down these different views so you understand them. But in order to do that, I have to talk about another concept that is common to all Christian views of the end times that people try to understand, and that is the concept of the millennium. So this is, or the thousand years, the millennium. This is discussed in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 20, verses 5 through 6. This is what it says. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and they shall reign with him a thousand years. So Christian views of the end times have to understand what is the meaning of the millennium, what is the meaning of the tribulation, when will Christ come again. So what I want to do now, where does, does a rapture fit into any of this? I'm going to talk about four Christian views of the end times, and I will start with the one that is closest to what the Catholic Church teaches about the end times, and they all deal with the millennium. So there's amillennialism, postmillennialism, and I'll talk about two different versions of premillennialism, and that deals with the question of Christ's reign on earth. So it seems here that Revelation chapter 20 is talking about how believers shall be priests of God and of Christ. They shall reign with him a thousand years. So that thousand-year reign of Christ, what does that mean? There is an amillennial view, a postmillennial view, and a premillennial view. So to summarize before I go into the, the four views, I, I have three here, but premillennial can be split up. A millennial will say that we are reigning with Christ now in the age of the church. We are in the midst of the millennium, and it is a symbolic millennium. It's not actually a thousand years. The millennium where Christ reigns is the reign of the church here on earth. Post millennial will say that Christ will come again after there has been a thousand years of of Christian paradise on earth, of a, a reign of Christianity on earth for a thousand years, Christ will come post 
or after that millennium of a literal thousand years of a Christian paradise on earth. And then pre-millennial, uh, Protestants usually, pre-millennialism says that Christ will come before the thousand year reign, pre-millennial, Christ will come before the thousand years, and there will be that thousand year reign of Christ on earth, and then you will have the you will have the second coming. So let's go into each of the four views to describe them more in, in detail and where the rapture fits into them. So the first view is amillennialism. I know it says number four here. Somebody else made that on Wikimedia, the graphic. Uh, but it starts with the first coming, the incarnation in the first century. Then at some point in the future, you have the second coming, the final judgment. Christ will return, usher in the final judgment. All of that will happen at one event in the future. And between the two, you have the symbolic millennium. So the number 1,000 in Scripture is often symbolic of just a very large number or a very long time period. And so when Revelation talks about Christ reigning, it's talking about Christ reigning through the church here on earth. Also, Revelation talks about the devil being restrained for a thousand years. Uh, And so during this time period, you have church fathers like St. Augustine saying that when Christ reigns through the church on earth, the devil is restrained so that the gospel can be spread throughout the world. He writes, The devil was thus bound not only when the church began to be more and more widely extended among the nations beyond Judea, but is now and shall be bound till the end of the world when he is to be loosed uh, at the final judgment so that Christ can conquer his enemies and conquer death itself. So this is amillennialism. There is no rapture here. Christ will just come at the end of time. There'll be a final judgment, and that will be it. Those who are alive will meet Christ at the end of the world. Those who are dead will be raised for the final judgment. Uh, So that'd be amillennialism, probably the closest view to Catholicism when we look at these different Christian eschatologies, views of the millennium. Another one that was common in the 19th and early 20th centuries is post-millennialism. So it says, you know, Christ's first coming in the first century, and then Christ will come again uh, with a a second coming, the final judgment sometime in the future, where this view post-millennialism differs from amillennialism is that post-millennialists believe Christ will come after a literal 1,000-year period where there is a Christian paradise, once the entire world has been converted and there is a Christian, you know, essentially a a Christian world. When the whole world has been converted, then you have peace for a 1,000 years, Uh, the devil will be bound during this time period, but at the end of it, Christ will return. This view is a very optimistic one, and so there was a lot in the 19th century. People were, you know, developments in the 19th century, the world seems to be improving, even in the early 20th century. But then when you get to World War I, World War II, the Cold War, uh, you see fractures in the the latter half of the 20th century. Most Protestants abandoned post-millennialism. They did not think there would ever be a period where the entire world would be converted and only then Christ would return. A lot of them ended up embracing something called pre-millennialism. And so that would be the third view, though there's two different kinds of pre-millennialism dealing with when the the idea of the rapture. So even here, we don't have the rapture appearing in what is called post-tribulation pre-millennialism. So what they say is that Christ came in the first century, uh, and then the second coming and the final judgment are divided. There will be a literal 1,000-year period. Christ will return. He'll reign for a 1,000 years on earth, and then there will be a final judgment. But before Christ returns, there will be a tribulation. So these are called post-tribulation pre-millennialists. So I know this is confusing. I'm going to try to break it all down. If you're, if you're listening on podcasts, you might find the graphics. I'm using to describe this on, on YouTube to be helpful. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe to the podcast. That's always nice to do. So just to break it down, uh, the big difference here with the pre-millennialists, unlike post-millennial and a-millennial, which is the closest to the Catholic view, is we have a split Christ's second coming, but the final judgment happens much later, a thousand year la- years later, when Christ will reign. But before Christ's second coming, you have the, the tribulation. So I think we would agree that there will be a tribulation and a second coming, but you need to compress this millennial period. The last judgment happens at the second coming itself. I'll explain that, you know, what the, what the Bible says about that. 
But the view where the rapture fits in is not so much post-tribulation, pre-millennialism. It would be pre-tribulation, pre-millennialism. So strap yourselves in as we go through this. Christ's first coming in the first century. And then, like the other premillennialists, you have a tribulation. Christ will return, reign for a thousand years. Then there'll be the final judgment. Pre-tribulation, premillennialists believe that Christ will come before the tribulation, before the bad events at the end of the world. He'll come before that to rapture or take the church with him. Then you'll have the nasty tribulation period. Christ will come again with the church reign for a thousand years, then you'll have the final judgment. So the rapture fits in here is in pre-tribulation, pre-millennialism. So pre-millennial, Christ will come before, reign for a thousand years, then the final judgment. Pre-tribulation, pre-millennialism says Christ will... So basically, there are three, com- four comings of Christ under this view, not two. You have the first century, the rapture, coming again with the church for the, the millennium, reign for a thousand years, then the final judgment. Uh, and so this is where you, you get these problems. And there are even some Protestants who are called mid-trib rapturists, who believe the rapture will happen in the middle of the tribulation, not before it. So there you go. But should we? But let's boil it down to this issue. Should we believe that the church will be spared the tribulation, Christ will, will take them, and then he'll return again, reign for a thousand years, and then have the final judgment. No, because it's very clear that when Christ returns, he is going to come in the same way that he left, in a public, visible, manifested way. Acts uh, chapter 1, verse 11 says uh, that, you remember when the, the disciples are seeing Jesus ascend into heaven, two men in white, who are probably angels, tell them, men of Galilee, why do you look at the heavens? Christ will return in the sa- he will come in the same way that he was seen going into heaven. So you won't have a secret return, an invisible return for the rapture. You'll just have Christ coming again. It'll be public, visible, and known, just like you see in 1 Thessalonians 4, the sound of the trumpet, the archangel's call. Everybody will see and know it. It won't be some kind of secret event like the rapture. Also, you have Matthew chapter 16, verse 27. It says, The Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then, not a thousand years later, but and then he will repay every man for what he has done. So Matthew 16, 27 seems clear that when Christ returns, he will come in glory, he'll be visible, and at that moment, not a thousand years later, not spread out, but at the same time, that is when the final judgment will take place. For those of us who are alive, We'll be caught up to Christ. We'll be with him when this all occurs. If we are dead, Christ will raise us from the dead. Finally, let me just address two other Bible passages that come up when people speak about the rapture. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it talks about how we will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Some people take this to mean that in an instantaneous moment, we will be caught up with Christ. And so this is talking about the pre-tribulation rapture. It's not because 1 Corinthians 15 verses 51 through 55 are talking about the end, not the rapture, and then the tribulation, and then the millennium, then the final judgment. Where this comes from in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it's talking about what will happen at the end of the world. Uh, It says the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable. Verse 55 says that death will be swallowed up. So here, this changing is that at the final judgment, when uh, the resurrection of the dead— we will be changed, and our our perishable bodies will put on an imperishable form, as St. Paul says, so that we can enter into glorious, glorious eternal life with our resurrected bodies. Finally, in Luke chapter 17, there is a verse there when Christ is talking about the end of the world. Uh, People, a lot of that interpret that as the rapture. It's Luke 17, verses 34 through uh, 37. It says, "'I tell you, in that night there will be two men in one bed,' The verse is actually two people, uh, is a better translation. Two people in one bed, one will be taken and the other left. There will be two women grinding together, like grinding at a mill. One will be taken and the other left. And they said to him, where, Lord? And some of you only read this verse and think, oh, this is talking about the rapture, right? You'll have the Christians will be plucked away, and people are like, well, where did he go? What's happening? And then the tribulation and all of this. Uh, no, actually, in, in Jesus here in Luke 17 is not saying the believers 
will be taken away and the unbelievers will be left for the tribulation. He's not talking about that here. Because a few verses earlier in Luke 17, verses 26 through 27, he says, As it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married, they were given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. So here, those who are taken away in Luke 17, 37, Jesus says, said to them, where the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. They say, where, Lord, where will they be taken? And Jesus doesn't say, oh, to me or to heaven, because they're the, the true Christians who've been raptured. He doesn't say that. He says, where the body is, there the eagles, or that same Greek word can be translated vultures, will be gathered together. So here he's not talking about being taken away to salvation. He's talking about being taken away to judgment. And we know it's judgment because he's talking about how the judgment will come swiftly like it did in the days of Noah. And those in the days of Noah who were not prepared, they were swept away. Those were the the unbelievers. So here Jesus is saying in Luke 17, look, the day of judgment will come unexpectedly. Another comparison he often uses is like a thief in the night. So be prepared. For it. That's all he's saying here. He's not talking about a rapture or anything like that. So I hope this is helpful for you all. But yeah, don't be sucked in by all this. The point is just just be prepared. Be prepared. Oh, that was a that was a nerdy reference, uh, Lion King. Be prepared. Okay. Uh, either for the end of the world or statistically likely your own demise and end. To know that if you were to die today, are you in a state of grace to know that you'll you will be with Jesus Christ? If you're not, go to confession or make an act of contrition and then make a perfect, make an act of perfect contrition. People often say, if you can't go to confession, make a perfect act of contrition. No, don't say the act of contrition perfectly. Make an act of perfect contrition, which is having sorrow for sin at offending God and you just, you wholeheartedly desire his forgiveness. So if you're in a state of grace, stay there. You're not, go to confession Make a perfect act of contrition. If you're not able to go to confession right now, but get your act together so that whether it's the end of the world or the end of your world, you're ready to meet Christ uh, at that moment. So, hey, thank you guys so much. Uh, I'll leave some links in the description below for good books on the rapture. There's a great book by David Curry and Paul Thigpen as well, and other great resources on it at catholic.com. So, hey, thank you guys, and I hope you have a very blessed day. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you want to help us produce more great content like this, be sure to click subscribe and go to trenthornpodcast.com to become a premium subscriber. You'll help us create more videos like this and get access to bonus content and sneak peeks of our upcoming projects.